In Singapore, a highly anticipated gathering came to a close. Speaking after meeting with the U.S. Secretary of Defense, the Chinese Minister of Defense, General Wei Fenghe, told reporters it went smoothly. He said the talks were honest and sincere. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said they covered global and regional issues. Al Jazeera understands it included discussion of the war in Ukraine, as well as some of the regional flashpoints, including Taiwan and the South China Sea. What we've seen um, on the South China Sea is that despite the pandemic, um, problematic actions in the South China Sea have continued. These include, number one, um, Chinese encroachments upon the exclusive economic zones of various coastal states. The defense chiefs met on the sidelines of the Shangri-La Dialogue, the most significant security summit in the region. Organizers say the importance of the three-day conference is mostly about what happens behind closed doors. If you're one of the more than two dozen defense ministers that come to the Shangri-La Dialogue, you're coming not just to speak, but in order to have a range of bilateral meetings. Secretary Austin also met with defense officials from Southeast Asia as the U.S. seeks to reassure countries of its commitment to the region while Beijing's influence continues to rise. China's engagement on the economic front has been sustained not just um, in the last year or two, but it's been sustained over decades um, in terms of its trade engagement with the region. While most of the world's attention will be on the US and China, for other countries in the region, the summit is also a chance to re-establish their defense priorities and connect with their peers. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida told delegates his country wants to contribute to peace in the Asia Pacific. We must not repeat the scourge of nuclear weapons. The threat of nuclear weapons, let alone the use, should never be tolerated. As the Prime Minister of the only country that has suffered the devastation of atomic bombings, I strongly appeal for this. The Shangri-La Dialogue is taking place after a two-year hiatus and with growing concerns about the region's stability, experts say it's a timely return. Jessica Wash a flurry of diplomatic activity as the U.S. seeks to emphasize its commitment to the security of the Asia-Pacific. No region will do more to set the trajectory of the 21st century than this one. The Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin held talks with several peers from Asian countries during his visit to Singapore, including his Chinese counterpart, General Wei Fenghe. At what's called the Shangri-La Dialogue, Austin told delegates Chinese military activity around Taiwan is a threat to the region. And we remain focused on maintaining peace, stability and the status quo across, across the Taiwan Strait. But the PRC's moves threaten to undermine security and stability and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific. Analysts say the defense chief's speech underscored major differences between the U.S. and China. Secretary Austin mentioned a lot about the international uh, order, especially the rule-based order. I think for the Chinese, the question is whose rules and whose order? More than a dozen defense chiefs from around the world are in Singapore for the security summit that's considered the most important in Asia. With regional stability on the agenda, defense chiefs stepped up to share their vision for the Asia-Pacific. While Lloyd Austin's speech was the main event of the day, other speeches also caught the attention of attendees. Managing including one by Indonesia's defense chief, Prabowo Subianto. We have come to our own, the Asian way of resolving these challenges. I think the Chinese like that message very much because it uh, goes in line with the Chinese position that Asia is Asian Asia. Subianto told Al Jazeera his country and many others don't want to take sides. The United States has helped us many, many times uh, in, our, in our critical uh, moments. But China also, China has also helped us. China has also defended us. Thank you very much for hosting. Officials from the Five Power Defense Arrangements Pact also met on the summit's sidelines. The defense ministers of Malaysia, Singapore, New Zealand, Australia and the UK say the historic pact has modern relevance in the face of tensions in the region. A world where uh, there are pretty complex strategic challenges. 
China's defense minister will address the summit on Sunday in a speech that's expected to outline Beijing's vision for meeting those challenges. Hello, China's defense minister has issued a stark warning. Foreign interference in Taiwan is, quote, doomed to fail. Wei Fang He's address at the Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore focused on Beijing's stance on Taiwan. Tensions between China and the U.S. are front and center on the last day of the summit. On Saturday, the U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin accused Beijing of intimidation and aggression towards Taiwan. China says the island's reunification with the mainland is inevitable. We will resolutely crush any attempt to pursue Taiwanese independence. Let me make this clear. If anyone dares to secede Taiwan from China, we will not hesitate to fight. We will fight at all costs and we will fight to the end. This is the only choice for China. This is a war game that takes a look at how the United States might react if China were to invade Taiwan. The self-governed island, a little bigger than the state of Maryland that sits about 100 miles off the coast of mainland China, at the junction of the East and South China Seas. China has seen Taiwan as a breakaway province ever since Chiang Kai-shek and his forces fled there following their defeat by the communists in the Chinese Civil War in 1949. China has vowed to take control of this island, preferably, it says, by peaceful means, but possibly by force if necessary. Increasingly, U.S. officials warn it could be by force and possibly sooner than we think. So what would the U.S. do? Well, the United States has ever closer ties with Taiwan, which it sees as a key partner in the Pacific security order. Whether the United States would defend Taiwan if it were attacked by China, however, is a matter of what's called strategic ambiguity, which has been the official policy for more than 40 years. The Pentagon, though, is unambiguously preparing for that possibility. And war games, which are simulations of military conflict that help develop and test strategies, well, these war games figure very prominently into those preparations. And we wanted to know more about these war games. What do they look like? How do they unfold? What would it take to win, especially in this moment we're in and what's happening in Ukraine? So to find out, we worked with the Gaming Lab at the Center for a New American Security, CNAS. This is a think tank that specializes in national security. CNAS convened two teams to fight it out here in our Washington studio. The blue team, a group of defense experts, members of Congress, and a retired Air Force general who played the role of American defense officials on the National Security Council advising the United States president. And the red team. China experts and the CEO of CNAS played the part of China's Central Military Commission advising President Xi Jinping. CNAS drafted the terms of the hypothetical conflict set five years from now in 2027 with China poised to launch a direct attack on Taiwan to force unification after Taiwan had elected new leadership increasingly defying Chinese pressure. How would the U.S. respond? There were three rounds and a game master from CNAS determining the new reality on the ground after each round. The red team had the benefit of proximity. The blue team had the benefit of allies and partners. Neither team had the edge, and that's where we begin. As you can see here on the map is a very large concentration of Chinese People's Liberation Army forces at potential ports of debarkation for an invasion. We want to focus on uh, a last-ditch effort to deter. This is a time to be sending the strongest possible message to Beijing, both privately and publicly, that there will be very severe costs if they actually go through with this. China has sort of seen our reaction to Ukraine, and we want to make sure that, that we're surprising them with how we react here. Hit the Americans as hard as we possibly can in the Western Pacific, keep them out of the fight while we move on Taiwan. I would support uh, early knockout punch against Guam. From our point of view, a failed invasion of Taiwan is worse than the risk of conflict with the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, we think that the United States is already going to intervene, and so we have to do a knockout punch before they can neutralize us. Is the assumption that your assault on Guam is going to make the United States pull back? We think it's going to make them militarily less effective. Uh, and so even if they desire to intervene, they won't have as much capacity uh, to, uh, to intervene on behalf of Taiwan. I think we, we start very forcefully with a missile bombardment on Taiwan. I think we want to bring the military to their knees. Are you making an assumption that, when, that China is going to attack any of the alliance as they attack Taiwan or not? I think China would, doesn't want to. They would like to tell the world that we're going to discipline our unruly province and it's none of your business to stay out of it. Mm -hmm. And if we stay out of it, they'll stay out of it. But if we decide to defend Taiwan, then I think they will attack our forces around the region. The priority for the first 24 hours is to try to 
go as fast as possible against Taipei, right? I think it matters to deter United States, Japan, Australia, and other countries from intervening. We learned the lessons from Ukraine uh, when the Russians led Zelensky survived, uh, and he organized resistance, he got international support, uh, and we're not going to let Taiwan do the same thing. We try to keep Japan neutral. I think, I, think you, I think you get them in the port before they get out, because otherwise we know exactly where they're going, which is toward Taiwan to start shooting at us. By, by hitting them in the ports, you are guaranteeing that Japan is going to carry not sure that we can. Would you rather take the American uh, military station in Japan out to the greatest degree possible and have J Japan enter the conflict, or let it steam toward Taipei, attack us, and have Japan maybe stay out of the conflict? Those are the two options. You're going to attack Japan? We are going to attack U.S. facilities on Japan. Uh, so with U.S. air bases and U.S. ports uh, that the U.S. uses in Japan, we are not yet going after Japanese air bases. Part of this is communicating. You're not just taking on this little you know, rogue island that you see as your own, Taiwan. You're taking on the United States, Japan, you know, Australia. I'm sort of in the camp of let's be as aggressive as possible short of launching a preemptive strike, if that makes sense. Regardless of which course of action the Chinese Red Team takes here, if we are prepared for the bigger fight, the potential large strike campaign, we are better off than if we assume that there's going to be a blockade or a lower level fight and then suddenly find ourselves in a much bigger war. The insight that comes from this is you have to have a peacetime posture that allows you to be prepared to deter on day zero and f fight if, they, if deterrence doesn't work. All right, Stacey, high level here. What just happened with move one? China's invaded Taiwan. It began by attacking Taiwan's outlying islands near the mainland. Then it followed it with a large uh, air and missile strike on Taiwan and on U.S. bases in Japan and on U.S. bases in Guam and the Northern Marianas. In response to that, the United States followed up with bomber attacks on, US shi on Chinese ships in port, and there was an air battle over Taiwan where American aircraft flying from the Philippines came in and um, engaged in combat with Chinese aircraft that were trying to bomb Taiwan. So after move one, can you assess which team is winning? I think it's a stalemate right now. Uh, China has strategically blundered by pulling Japan in, and the United States is still well positioned to defend, but China also has a lot of its assets left and has a lot of power that it can apply. China went with a very, very aggressive uh, strike campaign against U.S. forces and bases throughout the region. The gloves are off, if you, if you will. Mm -hmm. I mean, by attacking U.S. territory of Guam, killing Americans, the Chinese have crossed the line. Um, I think they've also miscalculated already that they, they took some actions against U.S. forces in Japan that they thought would maybe prevent Japan from coming in. It actually drew Japan in. Same with Australia. How do we prevent the, the Chinese force that's trying to get across the Strait of Taiwan to be, actually be able to successfully land and start um, taking Taiwanese territory. Now this is just a matter of getting as many things into the fight as we can as quickly as possible. Getting the Australians involved in a blockade and taking out what's in the Strait with the Marine Little Regiment subs that align on our allies to watch the rear and maintain supply lines and maybe implement a blockade while we're fighting yeah. in the straight in and around the straits with Taiwan. We believe the longer this takes, uh, the less able we will be able to uh, achieve our objectives. And so we are in, in the course of this building in fallback positions, although uh, we don't want to tell that to the other team. Move two is building on all of that mm -hmm. and moving forward to land on Taiwan to further try to take out uh, American assets in the region and also to go after Japan, which has entered the war. The fact that they aggressively hit Guam and Japan uh, was frankly um, just a very quick way to make sure our allies were all in and now we have Japanese resources willing to contribute to air and undersea. We have Australians willing to con contribute and others coming on board. And my sense is that we need to at least take out the airfields in uh, northern Australia so at least try to. Mm -hmm. So like Darwin and Tyndall? Darwin and Tyndall. Um, the fuel tanks are very important because that's how those planes get refueled and the runways are important because it needs to take off. 
In Hawaii, you have both obviously American territory, which they seek to preserve, plus you have uh, all of the naval and air assets that the Americans have dispersed back that way once this war started, so there's a lot of targets out there. They hit our ports in China, and we're going to take the fight to Hawaii. I'm a little bit hesitant to use conventional kinetic attacks in Hawaii just because I feel that will be interpreted as a Pearl Harbor in the United States. Yep. Look at galvanized significant U.S. support. China's big strike, which was in response to the U.S. Uh, attacking its ports, was on Hawaii. And they launched uh, their stealth bombers, and which launched cruise missiles and hypersonic weapons against Hawaii. They took out the command center on Hickam Air Force Base, um, where they're controlling uh, blue air forces and commanding the air war. So an American state has now been attacked. What was the blue team's focus? The blue team uh, was focused on destroying China's big warships that provide a lot of air defense for the invasion fleet. So they had submarines within the strait. I would say right now the red team is ahead. They're starting to make progress towards their objective mm -hmm. of actually gaining control over Taiwanese territory. Mm -hmm. um, but they have a long, hard slog in front of them. After move one, you said we were at a stalemate. After move two, what would you say? I would say that China has a slight advantage right now mm -hmm. because it's actually ashore. Um, uh, the, so it has made progress towards achieving its objective. It still has a long way to go. But both sides are probably running low of some of the key missiles and munitions that they right. use. So the character of the fight might change going forward. All right. On to move three. I don't see anything in the game right now that means that the U.S. or the West would back down. I wonder if we could do a hump shot not over but near where the U.S. most of the U.S. forces are because that would be clear signaling to them that we are serious about using nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. But obviously we would want, wouldn't want it right over in this area at this point. So you're saying a demonstration explosion? Yeah, at higher altitude. And is this a bluff or are we really willing to use nuclear weapons? I think that depends on folks in the room, but I think in a, in a no kidding Taiwan scenario, if we are really in, uh, facing the prospect of defeat, we should be willing to use nuclear weapons. It might not be nuclear weapons on Taiwan, it could be a tactical nuclear against invading US or intervening US forces. A real big weakness is our inability to contest or, or threaten China's air superiority. We keep trying, but the difficulty is in our dispersed posture with limited access to tankers. We're not able to push enough tactical aviation forward over Taiwan to really maintain persistent air security or even just contest Chinese air security. I think the, the key insight already in this game is if you have not spent years preparing for this, pre-positioning munitions, getting the Taiwanese ready, pre-positioning your own forces, developing your dispersal bases, if you haven't spent years preparing for this, then you're going to be behind the eight ball the whole way. How about putting a bunch of fields on the island um, by the submarines and try to support the marines? The biggest concern is that the United States will come roaring back with everything it has, not over a short period of time, but a long period of time. We have calculated that America's in and America's in. Mm -hmm. uh, but there may be gradations of what it means for America to, to fight our country. And uh, we have seen time and time again, once the enraged bull elephant is fully stirred, right. its ability to make war and to generate the resources to make war is unbelievably large. The only thing the Americans seem to, to declare defeat on is really, really long wars. Tactical and violent Afghanistan, Iraq, wherever they wanted to go home, Vietnam, they wanted to go home. They get tired, but they don't get scared. I think experience has shown this bridgehead here, uh, just like in Ukraine, it's not going to be over in a few days unless Taiwan capitulates. If you watch what happened in Ukraine, you know, the actions that were taken before the invasion were important, but so is continued resupply. With Ukraine, you have borders that you can move things across. Right. Taiwan's a long ways off. So here we are after move three, the blue team, the United States seemed to increase, tried to do what it could to make command and control more difficult in the actual invasion itself of Taiwan and all of that. Uh, China and the red team wanted to send more of a message to the United States, uh, attempting to strike. Thank you.
Same thing that makes Taiwan a difficult problem geographically for the Chinese to solve makes it very difficult for us to, to resupply. So mm -hmm. if we weren't going to do a preemptive strike because we wanted the moral authority that came from responding to an attack on us, we at least wanted to be ready to start taking out their ships while they were in port, while they were transiting across the strait. And I think, I mean, the lesson for me is just how costly deterrence failures are. I mean, we've come accustomed to sort of low-intensity conflict over the last two decades. If this happens, I mean, a lot of people are going to lose their life, which is why we want deterrence to actually work, and which is why we need hard power in yeah. place prior to the conflict breaking out. You know, uh, Mickey Sherrill, I was, when I hear some other country has air superiority over anything, <laughs> we're the United States of America, but obviously we're a lot closer to their main name now. That was, to me, a surprise, that we could not establish air superiority over Taiwan. It's certainly a 
I think what we've been so concerned about on the Health Farm Services Committee uh, is the fact that we see China's growing predominance in certain areas and catching up very, very quickly to uh, what had been for decades really presumed superiority in military matters by the United States. And what was so helpful to both of us was to, you know, to be at the table for this working so that when we do make decisions for this country, when we are looking at how we modernize our military and, and where we strategically use the, the taxpayer resources that we're given most effectively, um, that we're thinking about uh, how to really, as Mike said, how to make sure this never happens. How do we make sure that we are able to present such a credible threat across the world that we never actually have to go into a hot war like this? Bonnie, you were saying one thing we just don't know is what the Chinese, what the rest of them derive the decision making process is through the writings of of the army, of the Chinese army, Mm -hmm. and they were very, um, you know, stuck to that script. What do you suspect they are going to take away from Russia's essentially failed attempt to? Do what the Chinese strategy for you, your Chinese strategy to do here was, which is to you know, take Taiwan quickly. That was the Russian strategy. It didn't work for them, and it didn't work for the Chinese. So I think China looks at what Russia is doing in Ukraine, and you don't see the Russian feel like it's just applicable to the PLA because of the differences in how Russia invaded Ukraine versus how China planned for Taiwan. So one thing I think China is going to take away is exactly like what we did with the war game, was uh, China's going to try to move much faster on Taipei because it's patient and focus of concentrated forces on Taipei. One other thing that China's taking away is the extent to which nuclear, uh, Russia's nuclear signaling deters United States and NATO from going into Ukraine. So I don't think the Chinese necessarily are confident that nuclear weapons will deter the United States from intervening to help Taiwan, but China is going to invest in its nuclear capabilities and will likely play up nuclear stability in the Taiwan conflict. You know, so, Mr. Morales, on the other one of the debriefs, after the uh, one of the moves, the chief surprise that, that the Chinese fired the first shot at first. Meaning, first comes to the they would just slowly move it, just basically go as close as they could without ever firing a shot. Uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, what are we going to do? They act up like the way well, I think in, in reality, what would happen is that China may indeed use a large-scale exercise as a cover for an actual invasion, as much as Russia has tried to do this. I also think that China will be better at Russia. I think they will do large-scale exercises year over year over year, and it be very difficult for us in the U.S. side to determine what is an exercise and what would be the actual invasion. Uh, that being said, uh, from our point of view, we have to uh, establish air and maritime security, which means we have to fire the first shot. Safety is what? The idea that... I feel like we're very familiar with Russia's um, aspiration to use tactical nukes. Where are the Chinese right now in terms of this front? And, and obviously, in five years, they'll probably be better at it. But do they think that we can use nukes tactically? Other people at this table are probably better positioned to answer this than me, but no, their doctrine is explicitly no first use. But a lot of people are beginning to question that because their nuclear posture is changing and they're expanding their arsenal so much. They're building new nuclear weapons and new types of weapons where some of those medium and intermediate range ballistic missiles that they used in the game, they can uh, also carry nuclear weapons. So my biggest takeaway, and I, I want to save this last question for the two of you because you're, you're the elected officials. You're going to have to try to do this. We need an Asian NATO. <laughs> it, it is pretty clear we need one. Um, you know, Look at all of the assets we have to tap into right now to help Ukraine in so quickly, whether it's Slovakia, whether it's in Poland. There's not as many assets. That's what I learned from this. Can we do it? Well, certainly we have a lot of friends um, in the indo pakon region, and we spoke about some of our allies today, and mm-hmm. I think there were some other uh, allies in the region that maybe would have been a bit more helpful than was presented in the scenario. Korea, I mean, Korea would be the... Korea, the, South Korea. Yeah, um, the biggest one, yeah. But I, I do think... Um, there's a discussion to be had about making, uh, about doing more outreach here, doing more diplomacy here. There has been a hesitancy because of China's economic predominance. I'm mm-hmm. wondering now, as we look at what's just happened with Ukraine, if some of our allies in the region aren't more willing to become, um, to form a stronger partnership yeah. with each other and with the United States um, to ensure that, that they don't face some of these threats. You know, uh, Mike Gallagher, the, I, I go back to the decision 
by both essentially leaders of the of the political parties in 2016 to walk away from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Mm -hmm. This was going to be essentially what could have been step one in creating a, 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 West, a, a Western or a small D democratic umbrella in Asia. We didn't do it. Is it possible to, what, what, how do we do it now? Well, we may have to start with uh, certain bilateral agreements and put aside sort of the economic agreements. I think we have an urgent need for more basing agreements in the region. And that became very apparent throughout the war game. Uh, we had three treaty allies that were involved in the conflict, mm -hmm. but we still struggled to project power where we needed to project it. We quickly in the game clarified the policy of strategic ambiguity. Uh, we suggested that the president make it explicit that we would def defend Taiwan. That's something we need to reexamine in Congress, I think, to uh, very quickly, because we can't wait two weeks, three weeks if Congress isn't in session to have the debate and potentially give the president the authority he needs to defend Taiwan. So there are ways we can make progress, even though a big regional trade agreement is probably not likely in the short term. Well, I have to say, this was fascinating. I, I learned a lot, and uh, I hope some of the knowledge I learned we never have to actually use on air. No offense, guys.